Welcome to the Rise of the Challenge podcast. Join me today. She's a professional boxer, a Commonwealth champion, a philanthropist, and a motivational speaker. It's Stacey Copeland. How are you doing today, Stacey? Great, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I'm excited to learn more about your journey and your rise to the challenge. So we're going to start right at the beginning. Talk about a little bit of where you're from and what were you involved in growing up? Um, so I'm from Manchester in the north of England, northwest of England. And um, I was involved in loads of stuff as a kid, but predominantly uh, sport was my uh, true joy, um, my big passion and my big love in particular, football or soccer and uh, boxing um, and I started playing soccer at school, usually sort of in the playground um, at, at break time and lunch time uh, and after school and every, every, every time I could and uh, boxing and my granddad ran a boxing gym and my dad was a boxer um, so they took me along and encouraged me into that from a young age in the boxing gym and at home and that's how I got into both sports. With your father and grandfather who were um, in the boxing industry was that kind of like a motivation to kind of follow their footsteps in a way I don't think so I mean you know none of my siblings um took the same opportunity two of my cousins have um and I think it's just you know chance of what you get introduced to um I think I'd have been into some sport you know definitely it just depended what I got introduced to and sometimes it's about where you live and the, the people that you associate with I guess but um but I, just, I don't know why I just loved it from the first time I got introduced to it. And, you know, yeah, they were definitely massive influences, but it's not why I got into it. You just love what you love and uh, um, who knows why that is. I mean, equally for soccer, there wasn't anyone in my family who really played soccer. And yet I absolutely loved that. So um, I don't know why we love what we do, but I was fortunate to have two sports that I loved. What's something that you learned about yourself while you were playing soccer? What's like a skill that you gained from that? Um, off off the field or either on the field off the field. Um, I mean, I think you're, you're developing constantly in both areas. Um, but I think that the things that stick with you more are the things that you learn off the field because they apply to every other area of life. The things that you learn on a a, a soccer pitch are really only useful on a soccer pitch unless you're yeah. going to start tackling people in the street, <laughs> which isn't ideal. Um. See, so, yeah, I think the things that you learn off the field are applicable to all areas of life. And I think um, I learned um, a, a great deal. But, you know, I think I learned a lot about leadership, particularly when I was in America on, on a scholarship. I went out there on my own with uh, not very much money in my pocket and no sort of idea of what was going to happen, what to expect. I didn't know anyone there. Um, and to go and have that experience was quite incredible. And it taught me that, I, you know, I can go off and be independent, that I can follow my passions and then later came the leadership aspect where we, I was fortunate at my second school to have uh, a fantastic coach called Nick Cowell um, at St. Edward's in Austin. And, and he uh, worked extens extensively with us, particularly with the captains on leadership. And I learned a great deal about that there, which has applied to um, every aspect of my life since, really. When you were continuing pursuing education with college or university, was it hard to pick which sport you wanted to focus on or were you able to do both and being able to do it well? Uh, no, I only did soccer um, exclusively for uh, many, many years. I mean, boxing wasn't legal for women when I started anyway in England as a kid. So because I loved soccer and there were opportunities starting to open up in soccer for girls, that's why I went into soccer. And I did that for years and years before, um, you know, I had a few serious injuries and, I'd been abroad and done, you know, the things I wanted to do, which was play abroad, represent my country and play in the FA Cup, which is like our soccer Super, super Bowl. Um, once I'd done those things, I knew it was, you know, I still had this burning desire to go into boxing. And though, though I'd kept up with the boxing train and I'd never competed whilst I was playing um, soccer. So uh, the two complemented each other fitness wise, but I only ever concentrated on one at a time. You said that when you won the cup, was it hard to kind of make that transition or were you like, I've accomplished everything that I needed in women's soccer that I'm ready for that next challenge? The, the deciding to make the transition wasn't difficult. Um, it was actually the only thing that lifted me out of the, the dark hole that I was in. So the circumstances that led to the transition were very, very difficult, but the, the decision thereafter was not difficult. So 
I'd broken my leg in my final season, my senior year in America, which as you'll know is a prestigious thing and something we all look forward to. And I was devastated to break my leg in that particular season. I mean, any time isn't favourable, but certainly a senior year and we had such a great team and a great chemistry. It was heartbreaking. And then I somehow managed to get myself back for the last couple of games. And we went to California for the Sweet 16. And um, I hit the post with like seconds left on the clock and it went to penalties. And uh, in the penalty shoot, I'd scored one of the penalties that put us through the week before. Um, and this time, not so lucky, and the goalkeeper saved my penalty. Um, they scored theirs. And because they were third penalties, that was the deciding factor. And so literally when the player scored hers straight after mine, that put them through. And those moments of just standing there and watching their elation and euphoria and you wanting that so badly and feeling like your whole world had ended and like you'd let everybody down. It was just, it was, it was gut-wrenching and I never really recovered from it. I knew I'd never play soccer the same again. Um, I went to Sweden uh, to finish my soccer career because I'd already, uh, you know, agreed to that and committed to it, but it was never the same. And so that was a very, very difficult, difficult time and, and you know, finishing soccer. But then the obvious thing for me was, right, do you know the only good that can come from this that I could see? And the light in that tunnel was, right, now's my time to see if I can pursue that dream as a boxer. And so, yeah, the circumstances were definitely difficult, but the decision, not difficult at all. How do you stay focused overcoming injuries? How do you stay focused in that you're going to get through it and I got to push myself to get better so when I'm back on the field or in the ring, I'm at the highest um, ability if possible? Well, for me, um, there's, there's different elements to this, which I didn't realise uh, as a younger athlete, but I understood as I've got older. So first there's the physical, which arguably is easier to deal with than the mental and emotional. Um, and the physical side of it, you can have a general time scale. You can have things that generally, if you do them, it will have this outcome like anything else physical. So that's a little bit easier to manage. And of course you have your up and down days where some days, you know, you can do that rehab loads better. And then another day you feel like you've gone miles backwards. Uh, but that's the nature of it, I think. So in terms of the physical element, obviously having a really good um, athletic trainer who knows their stuff and can work well with you. Um, and then applying the same focus and dedication to rehab as you would to your sport. So I've always kept training diaries because I'm a, I'm a real nerd. And I've had training diaries, I've got them that go years back that I don't know why I've kept them and no one's ever going to want to read them, but still. Um, and it might have gone from like, you know, a three mile run and a, you know, a, a full training session to maybe straight after surgery, all you can manage that day is three sets of 10 leg lifts. But you have to treat it the same and it still matters, it's still important. So I continued my training diary, but just with my rehab. I dedicated myself to rehab the same way that I would have done with sport. I thought about ways that I could elevate my game without being on the field. So watching other players, uh, learning from them, watching loads and loads of soccer or boxing, whichever sport it was at the time, to learn um, and develop. So there are things that you can do physically, obviously, and, and following the advice that you're given and, and so on. However, the more difficult challenge, I would say, is the, the mental and emotional. Uh, because what's happened to me in the past when I've been injured is that because I'd my entire identity was sport, Therefore, when that was taken away, I had no meaning, no value, no purpose and no identity. And that's a very unhealthy place to be for an athlete because suddenly everything that makes you you, everything that makes you want to get up in the morning, everything, like I say, that gives you life, meaning and purpose is taken away. And there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. You just can't. It's going to come to every athlete at some point. And dealing with that is much more difficult. So I would say that as I've got older, I've, I've learned to separate the two that an athlete is you know athletics or sport is what I do it's not who I am it's a big part of who I am and a big part of my life but it's not everything and I've dealt with injuries better um in my latter years because of that um because my entire self-worth isn't um you know sort of uh, caught up with it all if that makes sense so when you were going into boxing and it was illegal for women to have boxing matches. What kind of mindset did that have on you? Were you more now, I have to just practice and train in case the change happens or you were doing it for the passion that you had for the sport? Well, I was um, 11 when it, when it first came to my attention because I thought I'd be able to get 
into what they call um, sort of, you know, exhibition bout skills, bouts where there's no winner or loser, you're just learning. Um, and when I went to get my medical card, my, my, that was when my granddad sort of said to my little my little mates, who were all boys, obviously, um, yeah, you can start fighting. And he said to me, oh, you can't. And I was like, what? And he said, oh, it's not legal for girls. And I just couldn't believe it. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, really gutting and I couldn't really understand it. I, I just assumed I'd be able to because I'd been doing everything in the gym that all the lads had been doing. Um, but yeah, I think because I loved it so much, I just c carried on with it. Uh, I, you know, nothing was going to stop me wanting to do it. But then when there was lots of opportunities opening up in soccer, it just made sense for me to go down that route, of course, because, um, you know, I was ready to compete and I, I loved doing both sports for enjoyment and fun, but I was a competitive kid and very driven and I needed a challenge. Um, so I wouldn't have stayed in boxing for that reason because there was no challenge there for me and I needed that and soccer offered that. So that's why I went into it. Um, over the years though, um, it's continued to be the case time and time again in both sports um, of being made to feel like a second class citizen and like you're the other, they're not as good as the inferior all of the time. And growing up, I believed that, you know, I, I didn't really question it because I, I was brought up in the same society as everyone else. I had this constant message in that women's sport's not as good. No one's interested in it. We, we're weak, we're strong, you know, whatever. And I kind of, you know, I, I didn't have any reason to question that. I thought, well, I must just be how it is. And it's, again, as I've got older and I've uh, learned more about the history of women's sport, educated myself on the journey that we've been on and, and started to understand the societal things put in place that create those perceptions and now I know them not to be true. And that's why it's important for me to be that voice as much as I can so that younger athletes, young women and young men um, get, you know, a different narrative because the one that we've been told is, is not true. I think over the time, women's sports has definitely evolved. And nowadays, women's sports are even as popular as men playing. I mean, people want to support everyone out there. Um, for example, like the Women's Soccer Cup, the FIBA Women's Soccer that had a huge following here in America and everyone was supportive. And I think social media has definitely helped the cause because people can share posts, images, support their players. So I think with your support and the way that you do with your motivational speaking and all that, it's definitely, it's inspiring because you want to take something that you went through and you want to help the future generation to make it better for them. And we'll get into that a little bit. So when you were going to go amateur with boxing, how did you train and what was the difference between training for boxing than soccer? Um, so I got back from Sweden when I finished playing Sweden. Then me and my friend uh, Kim from America, uh, who she'd been in Sweden with me, we decided to go on a quick backpack around Europe because I knew that while she was here, she'd probably never get another chance to do it. So I said, like, while she would over the pond um let, let's go for it so we visited loads of places around europe it was fantastic and then she went home and then i knew it was time to get my head down and you know me and my dad went to work and we set a fight date in the february and we started training in the november and we just worked really 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 hard all over christmas um, and and ob certainly obviously in january building up to the fight um it was different in the sense that obviously you have um a team around you who are you know the, the difference with football and boxing is that you, you do have a team in boxing everyone says oh it's really individual and, and I don't feel like it is it's a massive team around you you can't do boxing without your coach you know and, and the people around you you need them before the fight during the fight in the minutes in between to train for the fight like it is a team effort the difference I guess is that when the bell goes you you compete on your own mm -hmm. whereas when the whistle goes you compete as a team that's literally the only difference but you're still very much part of a team in boxing so I think the difference in the training was that that you know suddenly I was I was training for me and, and for my coach who was my dad as an amateur um, as opposed to literally 10, 12, however many people's on your squad other people um, and it was, a, it was a lot harder in different ways um, because it is you, you, you can't sort of, you know, if you take a knock in soccer, you can go down for a little while and get treatment and sort of, you know, oh, get yourself up and shake it off and all that. And you can't do that in boxing. Um, you just got to keep going or the fight gets stopped and you lose. So it's all or nothing. So that's quite different in that way. Having your dad as a coach, 
was it hard for him to watch you during a match getting hit or like the emotion side like if you guys were disagreeing about a certain strategy or were you guys able to have like the same mindset and it worked out perfectly well I'm I think we had the advantage that I'm a similar style to my dad I fight quite like my dad uh, we've got an incredible friendship and bond that we've always had so that really helped um, and I greatly respected him as a coach. I liked his coaching style and it made sense for me and I was able to learn and respond well to his style of coaching. So that all really helped. So we didn't disagree on tactics, to be honest. It, it never, ever happened. And I know we're lucky like that because for some, um, well, predominantly father and sons, it doesn't work very well in boxing. But for us, it worked great. And it was just such a privilege to have all that precious time together in the gym and you know, going out to different countries, fighting in different parts of England and having those experiences together and winning the national title together, you know, because that may, meant we were the first father and daughter to both win senior national titles. And it was just, it, there were some special things like that that we got to share. So I didn't find it um, difficult at all. And in terms of him sort of being my coach, I've, I've heard him in interviews say that, um, you know, there's the part of him that's like, oh, this is my kid, you know, I don't want to get hurt. But then when it came to fight time, he just flicked that switch and he was in coach mode. Um, and that's what he did, and he did it very well. Um, so it worked brilliantly for us. We, we're very, uh, very fortunate and grateful for that. Going into the bout for a national title, how do you get yourself focused where you have to make sure you're on your game? And what happens after the bell when you win the title? The, the national title was a, a strange one, really, because it had been a rocky road to get there. That the, A couple of years before, I'd reached the semi-final and got through it and I'd got through to the final and I got E. coli that week and I was like being sick. I was, I was really sick and I just kept training, training, thinking it'll go, it'll go. And then eventually, because of dehydration, I collapsed on the Friday, ended up in hospital. So I didn't even get to the final, which was on the Sunday, obviously. And so the, the, the girl I beat in the semi-final, um, she then went and boxed in the final and, and won, which was great. Um, so there'd been that. And then... Uh, in between that, I'd, I'd then gone and boxed for England at the Europeans and won a silver. So the year after going into the Nationals, there was a massive amount of pressure because I'd competed for, for, for GB, obviously, you know, the Europeans and the Worlds. And you can really feel that pressure because, you know, if you're going to win a European silver medal, surely you should be winning your national title. And, you know, everyone's kind of watching and waiting to sort of say, oh, they're not that good or whatever. So there's a massive amount of pressure. And I think it helped my dad just kept saying, you know, fight the fight, not the occasion. Um, do, you know, what you know you can do. And so I think, you know, there was a lot of pressure going into that. Um, I'd had like a really busy year the year before with the Europeans and the Worlds. And I think, you know, I'd, I'd started to pick up little niggles and bits of injuries. So it, it was a struggle that camp, to be honest. Um, and then I remember a key thing is that my, my granddad had been um, having some tests and on the Saturday he was getting the results when I was in the semi-final and I knew he'd been to hospital for the results and nobody rang me so I knew the results weren't good because I knew if they'd have been good people would have rang me mm -hmm. so that was very much in the back of my mind he couldn't be at the fight with us where usually he did the corner and he was there and he couldn't be there um, and I knew there was something not right and then Obviously, I went into the fight, blocked it all out, got on with what I had to do. It wasn't, to be honest, my best performance. You know, it was a bit disappointing in that way, but I got the win, um, which sometimes is the main thing, or, well, always the main thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, afterwards, I came out and Grandad was there. He'd made it to the fight and he'd been, he'd been diagnosed with, with bowel cancer. So it was a massive thing in our family. I mean, he, he got through it and he's still there now. Um, but at the time, we didn't know that. So there was a lot going on in the background as a, as a sports person. You've You've got to, you know, if you can, find a way to be in the moment, which sometimes that can be really difficult, but oftentimes it's a real help having that in the moment mentality where you can block out the things that you actually can't do anything about and focus on what you can. And that can be both a, a blessing, but sometimes a difficulty, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's what we're there to do. It sounds like your whole family is a, a bunch of warriors, like you're able to overcome all obstacles and you're there supporting each other and it's great that it spans three generations and you guys all have this bond in a sport that you guys can all share and remember over years absolutely we're really fortunate that way and my nan 
she's involved with it as well. You know, she does the timekeeping and the recording of the fights and stuff. So, yeah, everyone's uh, been on board with it in some way. And, and whether it's boxing or other sports, sport is a massive thread that runs throughout my family on both sides and my mum's and my dad's side. And it's, uh, you know, there's some people who, who didn't quite get the gene who just do not understand it at all. And like, why would you want to do exercise at all? And that's fine. But generally, it's a, it's a very, very strong thread that runs uh, through the family and some of us are pretty addicted to it. <laughs> so how did you make a transition to professional career from being an amateur? So this came from a challenge as well. Um, and, and quite often these things, when we're going through them, there the doesn't seem to be a positive and we can't even imagine there being a positive. It seems ludicrous to think there'll be a positive while you're in that dark hole. Um, but looking back often, there has been, and I think that's what you have to remind yourself when you're in a dark place and facing a massive challenge in time to think this doesn't last forever, it will get better. And I will be looking back on this at some point and realizing it led to something good. Um, and that was certainly the case with the transition to pro boxing because what happened was I got, uh, just before the, the second time I was going back to the Worlds and Europeans, and obviously this time I wanted to go on better and get a gold at the Europeans and do better at the Worlds. And that, you know, it's what I'd trained, lived and breathed for really for the two years building up to it. Um, and then in the early start of the year, I got a really routine knee injury. Uh, should have been about a six week timescale recovery from surgery. But they made a mistake in the surgery, unfortunately, and, and caused a chemical burn all over my leg, um, which was severe. It was very painful. Uh, it got infected. I had to be rushed to hospital. So it was just the whole thing was awful. And it took a very, very long time, you know, to heal. And it, it had to be treated like a burn. You know, burns take a really, really long time. It's not like, you know, your, your typical rehab that I'd experienced. It isn't like that at all. So that was very tough. And not getting to go to the Worlds and Europeans was devastating because I, I didn't get to go to the Olympics and Commonwealth either because they don't have equal weight categories for women. So the Worlds and the Europeans was everything for me. Um, and then I think knowing that I would have had to wait another two years for that opportunity and that I'd likely be boxing the same people at nationals and all of that, it just didn't give me that fire in my belly. And I'm, I, you know, I, I'm just seem to be one of those people that needs 50-50 of 50% excitement and 50% fear for me to want to do stuff and that that wasn't there um, until I thought about turning professional and that excitement and fear combination was very much there and I thought right then this is what I need to do and um, I started looking into it and I was thinking what am I doing what am I doing I didn't tell anyone until I was really sure because I knew I was a bit too vulnerable to people saying no don't do that it's ridiculous and I, I made sure that I definitely knew I wanted to do it before I even told anyone so I couldn't be put off and I still didn't know what I was getting into, but off I went, and I'm so glad I did. What's been a major accomplishment in your professional boxing career that has been a big standout for you? I think, obviously, in terms of, you know, in the ring, the, the European silver medal, and certainly winning the Commonwealth title as a pro. So, um, uh, you know, I was so, so, I mean, a lot of this is, Obviously, there's a massive amount of hard work. You have to have a reasonable amount of talent and so on. But a lot of it is luck and timing. You know, being the first British woman to win the Commonwealth title is about timing. Um, being at the top of your game and not having injuries and not having something stopping you going to those things like the Europeans is, is a lot of luck. <laughs> Just like you can have bad luck and you don't even end up going, like also happened to me. So there's an element of that. So I'm really grateful that I got to accomplish those two things as an amateur and a pro. But... I think, to be honest, what, what blows all out of the water every time for me is, is my greatest accomplishment is, one, on a personal level, the person that I've become because I, I didn't feel proud of who I was and what I did years ago. I, I took on board those comments of, you know, um, it's not the real England football team, it's the England women's football team. Women shouldn't be boxing, it's unfeminine, it's this, it's that. And I got called shame and shemale and why do you want to be a boy? And I really internalised all of that and felt like there was something wrong with me. And now I've grown into a woman who's really proud of who I am and what I've done. And it's actually, you know, speaking out as an advocate for, for, for change and to change perceptions. So that's, on a personal level, a massive accomplishment and to feel worthy of this platform and use it. But um, in terms of the biggest accomplishment, full stop, is inspiring others. You know, whenever... I get messages from, you know, young boxers or young athletes or their parents or anybody else. If I've done a talk or they might have watched a fight or anything like that, 
that's always my greatest accomplishment, being able to use sport and my love of uh, sport and making a difference to impact other people positively. That's, that's my greatest accomplishment, no doubt about it. How has, when you, after you won the Commonwealth title and throughout your career, how has public perception from like social media and support been for you? I think social media, as you alluded to before, is one of the massive factors in women's sport because we've had this kind of, you know, boring default leadership in place with those in, you know, decision-making influential positions of power who've just resorted to the same old thing that it's the chicken or the egg. And when we're like, why is it not on TV more? Why is it not in the newspapers? Well, there's not as much money in it. You know, we did it. And it's just like this, right, well, if you don't put it on TV, no one's heard of it, so they can't get the sponsorship, it won't improve it, it's just a vicious cycle all the time. Social media has really kicked the ass out of that because you don't have to have a journalist that's been brought up with that perception to rely on them. You don't have to have a media person who's been brought up in that society. You don't need any of that, you just need somebody who says, I'm going to set up a women's sports channel or... I'm going to start doing a blog or I'm going to share loads of footage, whatever it might be, they can put it out there. And they are doing, like you say, in their droves, women are massive consumers of social media. Um, we're the, you know, we're the ones who spend the most money, certainly in the Western world anyway, um, in terms of online shopping and purchasing and, you know, all of that and using social media, you know, we consume it at m much larger rate than men do. So, if it's not for us, then who's it for, you know, and it's, and that's, that's kind of, and it's, it's also changing the thing that men's sport, we know has always been for men to play, but what goes along with that is it's always for men to watch. And what's starting to change is that, yes, we're encouraging women to watch, but also to play and, and participate, but also women like watching sport too. That's the bit that gets forgotten. Women like working in sport. They like being journalists and sports reporters and, there's a whole world that's now opening up and social media has been a massive part of it. So <clears throat> I have seen perceptions change massively and just watching the World Cup the other year, last year, there were some massive companies and corporations falling over themselves to get involved with sponsoring those teams and those individual players. And if you compare that with when I went to play for England and had to take unpaid leave from work and my boss made jokes about it and you know, didn't want to give me the time off. And he said, oh, you want me to give you a week off to play for a women's football team? And it was all, you know, I was like, well, it is the national team. To now, where not only are they getting paid, but there's people really wanting to sponsor them. Even that one little micro um, example um, shows you. And then, of course, when I took my niece, Ruby, um, she's 10 now, I took her to watch Man City and Man United uh, women play last year and there was 31,000 people in the stadium and it was an incredible atmosphere. When I played, that would never have been, nobody would have ever imagined that was possible and look, it's happening. So even those things um, are huge, but then we still have these really awful attitudes, which is why we still need to do what we're doing and you can't stop because you're never there. So you've really got to keep going with it. I think the one big thing that you mentioned was women watching sports or even going to the stadiums. I know from years um, as a sports management major, women's like apparel, like for what women can buy, like shirts and apparel and stuff, it wasn't a big uh, amount or a variety. So a lot of women had to deal with the men's versions of stuff. But now you can go into a team store and you see all these different styles for women and now they can feel that they can support their team. They can wear something that's them. And I think sports are very capitalizing because if like someone's a married couple, they're going to bring their significant other with them. And if it's a female, they got to be able to make it female friendly. So yeah. they have like female drinks and stuff at bars and stuff. You know what? It does make a difference though. It does. And like you're saying, you know, there the, the wasn't much. Well, there was none when it came to yeah. soccer. Like when I played for England, the kits were huge because they were made for, they didn't, they didn't do women's kits, there was no such thing. It was a ridiculous suggestion that we should have kits to fit our bodies. Um, you know, the shorts were massive, the shirts were massive. They were these huge things yeah. that if the wind got in them, you could practically float. <laughs> um, so, you know, they were, they were, they were massive. And, and you know, the, the, these, like as you rightly say, these things are now changing and we're looking at these top 
professional female footballers who are wearing kits that are right for their physicality and their bodies and that's great and it's it, it does say that either as a participant or as a fan this is for you and that's important so talk about getting into public speaking are you still doing boxing at the same time or is it just this is giving you another challenge or another opportunity to go for yeah i mean it sort of happened by accident i guess i mean i've never ever advertised for speaking ever it's all word of mouth and people contacting me and um i predominantly or i only spoke in schools and for community groups and stuff because that's where i saw you know my my values really and the first time i got asked to speak at a business i thought no this this isn't for me like it's all about profit they're not my kind of people and i was totally wrong it was a massive challenge because i had massive imposter syndrome um, I felt way out of my comfort zone. I went in in my tracksuit and there was all these super duper like business women who just looked like, you know, they'd just been designed on like, you know, some special thing for Wall Street. And I was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? And, do you know, it was a, a, it had a profound impact on me that at the end of the talk, you know, the response was incredible. And I was reminded that they're just women like me. You know, we've got different pay scales, different status, different industries, of course, but ultimately they were women who had dreams years ago of doing sport and didn't get to do them. They were women who've been talked down to and treated as a second class or the other in their field as I have in sport. And they're also women who are sisters, mothers, daughters, whatever, and can see it from lots of different perspectives. Um, and that was the, that was the commonality. And, and, and so that, totally changed my view of stuff and now I've spoken in loads and loads of businesses and it's actually been very uplifting because I've realized that there's tons of businesses that are really passionate about doing the right thing for stakeholders they want to look after their staff um, they want to do something in the community they want to use our platform to do good in society as well as being you know obviously a thriving successful business but they genuinely care and want to use that for good and that's been a great thing for me to learn and to see and, and to work with some of these companies. So um, yeah, I, I just find it one of the greatest privileges to do uh, speaking. I, I really, really love it. And it's just a joy to do because it's, it's so simple. And it, in a day when we've got this, where you and I can speak on the other sides of the world, I mean, that's fantastic. And the technology we've got now is fantastic. But the beauty of it is, is that you just, I mean, yeah, you might have a PowerPoint and you might have some snazzy whatever's, but ultimately you stand and you talk to another group of people and open your heart, share your genuine story and, and hope to impact them positively. And what a simple thing, but so lovely that that, that is still happening in the world, that yeah. you can still have that connection. I, I really love that simplicity and human element about it. I remember when I took a public speaking class in college and I hated it. Like, I do not want to get up in front and talk to people about a topic because they're just all staring at you. But it's one of those things where if you're passionate about the topic you're talking about and you care about the story and you have a story to talk about, that's where the confidence for me starts building up. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to speak. I did. I always tell the story where I talked about the sport curling, which is, yes. the, and no one, it wasn't huge in America, but I was watching, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was watching the Olympics and I'm like, okay, and we had to do a presentation on something that we had no idea about, but we wanted to teach our fellow classmates about. So I went first because I'm like, I just want to get this over with. <laughs> I started talking about curling and I got a hundred percent. I'm like, wow, it, all it takes is doing some research, having that confidence and you can talk about everything. And you mentioned doing like these calls. I think the greatest thing for me is I'm able to learn from people by listening yeah. to their stories and being able to talk to people that I never thought I would. And because we're on other different country or different continents. And so I enjoy what I do. And I truly have enjoyed listening to your story. I think what you say is really important though about the confidence. And I think quite often because people are thrust into what, what they call public speaking because they're either asked to do something at work and they're not really comfortable about it or they don't really know loads about it or they don't see themselves as a speaker or whatever, it really puts them off forever. All those old school experiences, as can happen with sport, if they label themselves a non-sporty kid forever, then they have this fear of it forever, a bit like me with maths. Um, but um, I think, like, I love the comment that Brene Brown makes, uh, that she says you can choose courage 
or you can choose comfort, but you can't have both. And I think there comes a point, whether that's speaking out, public speaking, or speaking in the media, or speaking just to a loved one or within your family, whatever circle that might be and that sphere of influence might be, there comes a point where it's, it, it's that important what you've got to say and you're that passionate about it that you will choose courage over comfort. And whether that's, like I say, confronting loved ones, walking into the biggest arena possible, speaking on you know a massive show on you know or doing something on Netflix, however big or small that might be for each individual, it will feel equally as big to them. But if you're really passionate about it and you, you really want change, and then you will choose courage. And and it takes courage because there's a backlash quite often. Um, but it's it's worth it. I'd choose that every day of the week if it means that I can do something good and and you know that make things better for the next generation, as you are doing, which is brilliant to see. Thank you. Talk about the project Paved the Way. How did you get started with that? So um, when I started boxing, usually you have a boxing nickname, like it might be the Assassin or the Cobra or whatever. <laughs> I didn't have a natural, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I didn't have a natural boxing nickname because my nickname to all my friends is SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> because um, when I get injured and put weight and I turn into a square-shaped no. human being, so... It's not the best name for a boxer um, to intimidate anyone. So it was clear I couldn't go with that. Um, and then paved the way just just seemed to come out of nowhere, to be honest. And it just felt right. It felt like, I, you know, I wanted um, something that represented what I stand for, you know, what I want to achieve and paving the way for the next generation was, in the literal sense, what I want to do. So that's what we went with. And I set it up as a one week project the week after my debut which was also women's sport week in this country which we used to have um and i did like school visits community group visits we did a photography exhibition of women who work in sport who are largely invisible and that's on permanent display at the national cycling center now in manchester and then you know that was that really it was a brilliant week we you know we did some great stuff and that was kind of it but then it just really seemed to gain momentum and people were using the hashtag and talking about paving the way and I thought maybe there's something we can do with it here. So uh, now we're a registered charity. We've got official charity status uh, about 10 weeks ago, but obviously that was in the middle of major lockdown. So it wasn't a great deal we've been able to do, but now we, we're getting started in earnest and we, you know, we've got quite a lot done over the last few weeks with our trustees. And um, the ways that paved the way has changed is that originally it was just about getting girls and women into sport, you know, for one week. Um, now it's about more than sport. Because of all the business I've been into, I know there's a lot of women in law, tech, construction, other fields who've had similar experiences to me, but in their industry. And also I've had contact from a lot of parents whose son has faced <coughs> stigma because maybe the son wants to be a male nurse or they want to be a ballet dancer and they face stigma and that's not good enough either. And I don't believe that if you make things better for one group, another group misses out. I just think it's better for all of us. So pave the way sport is at the heart of it because that's what is, is at the heart of me and I think it's such a powerful thing for bringing about change in society that what happens in sport can impact other areas of life so it's about sport but every other industry and it's also about both genders and making things better um, and really when I say gender it isn't it's about the stereotypes of masculinity and femininity um, and challenging those stereotypes and roles um, but yeah so we've we're just getting started now. It's really exciting. There's a lot of work to do, but it's a very exciting time for us. I think that's one thing where we see it anywhere in every country where they have those, oh, the stereotypes that you have to be a certain way or you can't do this. And I think now we're seeing with the power of social media and all these people that are supported that whatever you want to be, you go for it. You do it. You take challenge the people that are saying that you can't do it. And I think that's what's great about the support that you can have with people that you may not know is they want to see what you can do at the level that you want to do it. So I'm excited to see what your organization is able to do once we're able to do a lot more with this pandemic. So what does the future look like for you professionally and personally? What goals do you want to accomplish in the next few years? Um, I, I just want Pave the Way to have the biggest possible impact it can. Um, you know, I want it to spark social change being honest in the way that we view masculinity and femininity and the things that have become social norms and acceptable that i don't believe should be 
So like using girl as an insult shouldn't any longer be acceptable. It's a powerful message. It's it's a very negative statement to young boys and girls. So even things like that, I think the language that we use, um, you know, if it can spark a social consciousness in that and a change, then then great. So yeah, in terms of pave the way, you know, I'm very dedicated to that. I want it to be the biggest thing it can be. Uh, public speaking, I just love. It's it's an absolute joy. It's it's just something I really really love to do, and so I'll most definitely continue um, to do that. Um, I'm also, you know. I'm at the early stages of radio broadcasting. I've been doing my own show now for two years on on the BBC at Radio Manchester, my local radio, and, and I've loved it. I've really, really enjoyed it. It's been a real privilege. And um, so perhaps that's something that, that you know, <clears throat> might develop. So I'm, I'm really fortunate that I've got lots of different things that I'm passionate about in my life. And I think that is the advice that I would give to any younger athletes that, this plan B stuff that we hear about, I don't think is a great route to go down because if you end up doing it, you know you're only doing it because the real thing you wanted to do didn't happen. And that's not a great way to go into anything. Um, that's like getting married and having a plan B person. Do you know, it's yeah. not great. Uh, yeah. So I think um, what's more important is to encourage athletes to find other things that they are passionate about. So that then even if sport finishes, it doesn't, you know take away from the passion you've got for that those other things so i think you know volunteering at places or looking at causes that mean something to you and getting involved with them whilst you're still competing means that if you do face an injury or time out of the sport like most athletes are facing right now or when you come to have to retire um early or on course whichever then you've got other things in your life and like i said before that sport isn't your be all and end all and, and who you are and without it you, you feel like nothing um so that's what I'd encourage others to do and I'm really fortunate that I've, I've had that I've always worked throughout my sports career because I've had to and that's led to you know I've always generally done jobs that I'm passionate about and that are vocations really um of, of helping people like I do still at the school um so I would encourage other athletes to do the same definitely final question I want to ask is for someone that's listening to this interview right now what tips or advice would you give them to rise to their challenge to overcome obstacles and accomplish their goals based off of your experience? I think you know, everyone has to find their own way. So I, I wouldn't probably give advice. All I can say is what's, what's helped me. Um, and, you know, hopefully that might be of use to someone else. And the, the things that I think have helped me is that, that I've realized that every time I've been in a dark hole, when I've been able to look back and reflect, it's led to something good that may not have happened had it not been for that dark hole that I didn't want to be in and that wasn't often by choice to be in. Um, so I'd say that when you're in that dark place and you're facing those challenges that you may have caused yourself or may have been thrust upon you, to really hold on to that belief that things do get better. It doesn't stay that bad. It doesn't stay the same forever, as bad as it feels at the time. It will get better and it may well lead to something positive. But in order to take those positive opportunities you have to be open to that as well so i think when we that i try and, and treat it as much as i can like a physical injury that there's things we know if we do them they hurt us more uh, so if i've got a bad ankle and i jump up and down on the ankle i know it's going to make it worse mm -hmm. and bizarrely we don't question that with physical stuff we just say that hurts so i'm not going to do it whereas with emotional stuff we keep doing things that hurt us we keep going back to the people we love who don't really love us the same and trying to change it and keep getting hurt and keep getting hurt. And, you know, if we've lost a job, we keep thinking about the good times and what ifs and all that. And it's actually just hurting us yet. We keep doing it with emotion. We don't do that with physical stuff. So that's one thing that, you know, if it's something that's difficult, try and change it to those other, you know, other thoughts that are more helpful. And um, just like jumping up and down on your ankle is not helpful, but icing it, and putting compression on it and elevating it and doing rehab is and it's the same with emotional mental struggles i think if we can cease from doing the things that we know are hurting at us more to try and stop doing those it seems obvious but it's very very hard to do you've got to be disciplined with yourself and then start to do the things that help that healing process and you cannot speed it up you know just like if you break a leg it's probably going to take you know a good couple of months to be better it might be the same with your heart or your emotions or your mind if you've had a trauma and an impact injury to your mind or your heart you know it, it takes time and we can't speed that up but we can do things that help it along the way so trying to see the positives 
doing the things that help us like getting out in nature. Nature is always there no matter what. So no matter how horrendous your bubble is, and we've all been there where you just think this is never ever going to get any better. You go out and you see, you know, the, the beauty of nature and you think actually beauty is still in the world. I just can't see it and feel it at the moment, but it is still there and I will feel it again. So even things like that with music, whatever it is that brings that joy to your life, remind you it's still there. So all of those kind of things really help me. And other people, you know, writing things down, speaking to others, those can all really help. Um, and then I have the people who I think of as my pe positive petrol tanks. And that's when my positive fuel is running low. The people I go to fill my tank up again with positive, positive gas or petrol, as you would call it, and I, I can trundle on. So I think knowing who those people are is really helpful as well. Well, Stacey, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your Rise to the Challenge. I've learned so much, and I'm excited for the listeners to learn all about your journey and the great advice you've been giving us today. No, thank you very much, and, and thanks so much for everything that you're doing, and thanks to everyone listening. I really appreciate it, and if anybody got any further questions and they want to get in touch, I'm more than happy to um, respond and, and you know connect wherever I can, but uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.